AC Hotels by Marriott is a European-inspired hotel brand where every detail has been refined, crafted, and considered to ensure a seamless stay. Wake up to the European-inspired breakfast with hand-shaved prosciutto, freshly baked croissants, and made-to-order hot items. Unwind in the AC lounge with their custom gin tonic served in a scientifically engineered glass. Get a restful night's sleep with the relaxing lavender turndown ritual. Visit ac-hotels.com and learn more about the perfectly precise hotel. AC Hotels is part of the Marriott Bonvoy portfolio of hotels. Hey, it's Will Friedell. And Sabrina Bryan. And we're the hosts of the new podcast, Magical Rewind. You may know us from some of your favorite childhood TV movies like My Date with the President's Daughter. And the Cheetah Girls movies. Together we're sitting down to watch all the movies you grew up with and chat with some of your favorite stars and crew that made these iconic movies happen. So kick back, grab your popcorn, and join us. Listen to Magical Rewind on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Brought to you by State Farm. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. It's time to get inside the Giants home. Let's go, let's go, let's go. On Giants.com. I like it, I like it, I and like it. And the Giants mobile app. Boom. Give me some juice. Part of the Giants podcast network. Let's roll. All right, welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. Free agency mode is now turned off. Draft mode is turned back on. And to get us back into the draft is friend of the program, joins us every year to talk some NFL draft, Eric Edholm, who writes for NFL.com. Eric, we are back into draft season here now that free agency has calmed down a little bit. Yeah, I am your draft reintroduction specialist, I guess. That's my role here. So uh, happy to be here. Good to join you, man. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've been patting the caffeine, too. I'm with you. And... <laughs> We're in a sprint now. I, I mean, I couldn't believe yeah. it when I looked down. We're recording this uh, on last Friday. It's it's airing on Tuesday, and it's four weeks. I mean, yeah. it's crazy how quickly this thing is going to come, Eric. And pro days are going on. Where is your head right now? <laughs> as free agency happens, all needs change. That's why I hate mock drafts before free yeah. agency because to me they're useless because team needs will change completely and teams do draft for need despite what they say in the media, right? Oh, so, sure. Uh, what are the your biggest takeaways from free agency and, and how you're now thinking about the draft in maybe a little bit of a different way? Yeah, you're right. I mean, just from from a from a humorous standpoint, it is funny because it was in the middle of, of all the action of free agency and – Somebody sent me one of the APT reports with all the pro day workouts, the updated numbers. And I'm looking at it like, oh, yeah, we're in draft season, right? <laughs> you know, so you do have to kind of pivot away a little bit. And uh, that is sort of my specialty. But I did focus on free agency. But, yeah, I think you're right now. I mean, you, you, you talk to teams and, yes, there are free agency matters of business that still have to be handled. Some teams have a lot more than others. You know, some teams are actively waiting for, uh, you know, the, the franchise guys to be signed, whatever. I mean, there's still plenty of stuff happening outside of the draft, but there are plenty that have shifted full, you know, headlong into draft mode at this point. And, you know, we had a big pro day uh, day the other day, and this is a gripe too. Like, why do we have to have USC, Ohio state, Texas, and Alabama all go on the same day? Right. Seriously. I mean, can't these school, I understand the schools kind of have their little dates that they use and every, you know, oh, it's like the th third Tuesday of March or whatever, but, but still, I mean, let's, let's spread these things out. Right. I mean, that way, you know, when we report that not many uh, GMs or head coaches go to Ohio state, well, yeah, cause they're all at USC and Alabama, man. So <laughs> it, it does, I think unfairly, uh, you know, there, there are a number of prospects who get hurt by it. But yeah, to me, it's like, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's and, and making sure all your medical information's updated and, you know, getting in whatever visits and interviews you can at this point. But a lot of hay is in the barn already. Absolutely. So the Giants are picking at six. Yep. Big picture wise, let's kind of set the stage there because to me, Eric, this is a <clears throat> great year to be picking six. Absolutely. A you have a lot of quarterbacks going early, which is going to help you push non quarterbacks down to you. Maybe the giants want one of those quarterbacks. We'll talk about that too, yep. but there's so many more blue chip prospects in this draft class than I think we've had, you know, maybe more in this one class and we've had in the last two or three classes combined, at least in my opinion, true guys that could yep. be a, a top three pick in a draft in any other year and multiple premium positions. I think the giants are in a fantastic spot. 
I do too. And it seems to line up with their needs, right? I mean, depending on how you define that, right? I mean, I, you could you could say every team would say every position's a need on some level. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, as I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, you know, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. would be the unquestioned, you know, no doubt number one receiver in almost any any class. But like you can make a case that Malik neighbors is right there with him. You know I mean? Like if you told me that Malik neighbors 10 years from now, will be a better pro, I wouldn't be shocked. Right. So there's that, that element of two number one guys, plus Roma Dunze, who could be a number one in any class as well. And it's not just receiver too. I mean, as you mentioned, quarterback is very strong. Offensive tackle is very strong, very heavy, early offensive influence on this draft. I don't know there's a clear cut obvious defensive player who goes in the top 10 but you know for the the offensive people the the fantasy football folks this is a very good draft and yeah I mean it really is heavy at the top with with some of that blue chip talent I mean I'm not quite as high on some of the edge rushers as some people are um I would say maybe cornerback I'm a little less enthusiastic and on the whole as everybody else but I mean, we're nitpicking. I do think it is a strong draft at the top. Maybe not at the bottom, but but at the top, it certainly is. Yeah, and and and, and we'll talk about the impact of NILs and stuff like that on the bottom yeah. of this draft class because it's stark. But before we talk about the Giants' options at six, let's talk about what's going to happen before the Giants get to six because the Giants yeah. can only pick who's available to them, right? Yep. At this point, I think we all know that Washington is going to pick a quarterback and the bears are going to pick a quarterback. Do you agree yep. with that general sentiment? Yep. I think that's fair to say it sound. It feels like Caleb Williams is going first. I mean, I'm sure Washington will, will make a last minute offer, but you know, even so they're only swapping places and you'd think the bears would be selecting a quarterback. So almost no matter how it works out, I think it's going to be QB QB to start the draft. Now, some people seem to think that a, might not be QB thir- three being picked by the Patriots at three. Right. And yes, they did sign Jacoby Brissett. If you go into your season as, as he is your starter, that's fine. And maybe the Patriots just don't like whomever is left on the board at quarterback when they get to three. That's possible. I have a hard time believing, though, for an organization that has literally lived through what happens when you go from an awesome quarterback to a not-so-awesome quarterback, <laughs> that if you're sitting there with an opportunity to pick a guy – that you like that you're not going to pick them. I would, I'm personally would be blown away if they trade out of that three hole. Yeah. Multiple non awesome quarterbacks uh, for the Patriots (laughs) in recent years. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's exactly how I looked at it too. I thought, boy, if there's ever a team that, you know, this isn't like the green Bay Packers who've had, you know, this uninterrupted spell of, of, you know, talented quarterbacks going on 32 years or whatever it is. But yeah, I mean, the, the Patriots had 22 years of, of Tom Brady. They've now had a pretty good, you know, this isn't just one season. It was basically from Cam Newton, et cetera, on through Mac Jones, obviously included, uh, you know, Bailey Zappi, whoever else, but um, it hasn't been great, you know, and, 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 it's a new regime. It's not Bill Belichick anymore. Yes, there's plenty of Belichick influence. But really, what I've been told is that this is Elliot Wolf's show. Speaking of the Packers, you know, obviously his dad Ron was the the architect of that 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 early uh start of the Packers uh, dynasty back in the early 90s and and I think a lot of the same principles that that Ron used, which was you got to get the quarterback position right. Like if you ever read his book, I mean, he said that's the spot where this is, you know, 30 years ago. This wasn't exactly the the prevailing wisdom. Everybody thought you build up your defense, you do this, you have a run game. Um, but he said, no, if you don't have that spot figured out, you're going to have a hard time winning consistently. And so there's that. But there's also the temptation of, hey, Ron drafted a quarterback just about every other year. And he yep. was always looking to kind of churn through that position. And maybe there's a trade down opportunity for him. So Yeah, I mean, it's highly likely a quarterback goes in that spot. I just don't know if it's New England, but I absolutely hear what you're saying. And then I think four and five are interesting. We saw Monty Austin for it with the Cardinals move around the draft a lot last year. I still think they're in the beginning of a rebuilding process. You look at that Cardinals roster. They made some additions in free agency. They drafted well last year. There's still a ton of holes. They're not in compete now mode. So that makes people think, all right, maybe they'd be open to trading down. The Chargers have been, I think, 
I mean, Daniel Jeremiah, who covers the team, has basically said the Chargers are looking to get out. That yep. means the Chargers are looking to get out. So you have two teams there looking to move. You have a quarterback four, who some people think is quarterback four, and J.J. McCarthy, that seems to fit into a Viking system that mm -hmm. I think would seem to fit into a Sean Payton system. Um, and the Raiders have a need for a quarterback, too. So there are multiple teams, I think, that would be willing to move up, Eric, to one of those four or five holes. Do you think one of those teams is more likely to move than the other? And how do you view that four or five pick sequence going? Because I think that's really the essential thing here as to what players will be left when the Giants select at six. Yeah, it's entirely possible. That's what, like, you know, we always say that's when the draft starts, right? <laughs> you know, that's the, you know, but, but there is some truth to it, right? If New England does end up just sitting, standing pat and taking, uh, let's say Drake May or what have you, I mean, you know, McCarthy, there's a real market for him. And when I said a month ago, when I'm about the time when I saw you, or maybe even a little before at the combine, I said, I'm telling you guys, you know, I went on a few radio shows and had people laughing at me at Twitter. I was like, just based on a few conversations I've had, McCarthy is going high. I don't know how high. I don't know if it's the fourth pick. I don't know if it's the fifth. I don't know if it's the eighth, whatever it may be. This is before Kirk Cousins signed, you know. But at that point, I thought there is a darn good chance not only is he a top 10 pick, but possibly quarterback three. There are some teams who aren't very keen on, on Drake May. There are a few who are a little skeptical of, of Jaden Daniels that I've been able to tell. Now, some of these are teams that may not draft a quarterback, but that, my thinking is always if one team has that line of thinking, there are others who probably think that way as well, at least generally speaking. But, you know, it, it's entirely possible that if it goes QB, 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 we could see a trade up for four and have four straight go off the board. Minnesota, I think, is is very interested uh, I'm sorry, Minnesota. Uh, yes, they're interested in moving up. But, I mean, I, I would think Arizona is interested in trading down. I think the Chargers are are more interested. But the question is how far, you know. I mean, we have – it's Jim Harbaugh and Joe Hortiz, obviously, running his first draft over there. And you don't we don't have a whole lot to go off of. But we do have the Baltimore influence, which has always been – you know, I mean, yeah, they've targeted players and moved up, but they've also made smart trades back as well. So, yeah, I mean, those those first five picks, I think, are really going to be wild. And then it sets up, obviously, what happens at number six with the Giants. Yeah, I want to dig in on your point on the quarterbacks, because I, I walked out of the combine saying that J.J. McCarthy is going to be a, a top eight pick and like it very yeah. easily and could be a top five pick just because, again, so many quarterback needy teams, you know, are going to try to want to move up to grab this guy. So. I guess my question for you, when you look at this quarterback position, for me, Caleb Williams stands alone. He's the number one guy. And then talking to people much like you have, that two through four, two through five, I think depending on the team you talk to, that next group can look very different in terms of order. I agree. Uh, you know, there, there's been another, you know, thing I got killed for the other day. I went on radio in Washington and they were saying, what are you hearing? And I said, I even made the point, like, look, you know, Adam Peters, the new GM there, obviously, you know, uh, Dan Quinn, et cetera, very, uh, um, you know, arranged marriage kind of situation. They've done a great job of keeping things like tamping down internal talk and speculation, which is great. You know, they haven't had any leaks that I'm aware of. Um, but you still got to ask other teams what they think is going to happen. Like, I mean, they're, they're going to be doing the same thing in their war rooms. Like, what do we think Washington's going to do? What do we think New England's doing? And a lot of people think Washington is kind of leaning towards Jaden Daniels. I've heard two different people that I think hold some some sway in this league. Now, do they have a direct line into the the Adam Peters brain? No, of course not. But yeah, I mean that could that's one possibility. It doesn't mean everybody feels that way, but there is a sense that maybe he's got a little bit of a higher immediate floor. Um, I've even heard some people say that about McCarthy. And I think that's kind of interesting too. You know, obviously he played in, in the playoffs the last two years, led him to a championship this year with Michigan. Pro played in a lot of high Harbaugh. leverage. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of pro ready elements about him, but he also hasn't thrown the ball a lot. You know, so I mean, you're starting, man. He's 21. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there's still a lot of stuff that he is the kind of guy that I think could grow through some struggles and probably would be fine if you had to throw him out there at a waste. But, but, but of the three guys that we just mentioned, I think Drake may is one that people are saying, I'm not talking Jordan love here where you have to sit him three years or whatever, but like, 
and they didn't have to sit him three years. That was the situation they chose. But um, yeah, I think it's wouldn't be shocking if if he ends up being a little bit of a later bloomer amongst this group, and that's just tamp down his 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 enthusiasm in the in the draft spheres just a little bit i still like the guy a lot i think he can be really good but he's not as polished or refined as justin herbert was coming out you love turf you're good at it so you start a turf biz business grows your savings grow become the most celebrated name in turf are you ready for all that life brings all right, so let's talk about our evaluations. And you talk about what the league thinks about them. To me, I, I have Drake May a, a, as my second quarterback and Jaden Daniels like just below him. Like they're right in the same tier for me. And yep. I have them both as 10 top 10 worthy picks. And then I kind of have J.J. McCarthy more in that, all right, 15 to 20-ish area for me personally, yeah. right? Um, and I'll just give you my little rundown on why. Drake yep. May, I think tools are immaculate. Willing to throw into the middle of the field. The number of middle of the field, tight window NFL throws you see on his tape is, is phenomenal. I think he is mobile and runs better than a lot of people think. A little scatter yep. shot, decision making can be a little iffy. I think a lot of that has to do with the situation around him in North Carolina with the protection. And frankly, besides Tez Walker, is only there for half a year, uh, the lack of separation at receiver. Um, Jaden Daniels, super accurate downfield passer. Great runner. Don't think he's as elusive in the pocket and avoids the rushes some as well as some people think. But I think once he's out there, he runs really fast. I think he makes big plays with his legs. Really accurate on deep throws. Didn't see as much of that middle of the field timing, short, you know, small window throws that I like. That's why I have him a notch below May. Then you get to McCarthy, right? Super accurate in the middle of the field, intermediate areas. Love throwing crossing routes, which obviously, which mm -hmm. is why I made that kind of the you know, Shanahan, O'Connor, you know, type of connection in terms of that type of um that uh that type of system. Mobile, but I don't think he is the biggest arm, right? I think his deep yeah. ball is very flat. I don't like his vertical game. And he is sometimes a little bit less accurate than I would like, especially later in the year. You know, people want to kill Drake May for those last three games. Virginia was one of them. I'm trying to remember what the other two were when when he didn't play that well. No one talks about the J.J. McCarthy game against Maryland when he should have thrown four <laughs> interceptions. Yeah. I mean, that game was a legitimate disastrous game. It was just as bad as any of those bad Drake May games left at, you know, late in the year. I just don't think McCarthy is quite the tool set and toolbox that a guy like May has. And I do think, as we see in the NFL, who are the best quarterbacks in the league? It's the guys with elite tools. So yep. that's kind of how I view those guys. Then I have Penix as more of a second round guy. Nick's I'm still watching. I love his on time accuracy, but again, doesn't have the big arm. I think he's a Sean Payton quarterback myself. That's kind of how I view that group of quarterbacks. Eric, I'd love to get your take on them. Uh, we, 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 we park our cars in similar garages. I think a lot, a lot of the things you said are, that really resonated with me and I'm the same way. Let's work backward. You know, Penix, if someone were to take him late first, it wouldn't shock me. The arm talent is is really enticing. You know, he's got the guts. He's sort of the cat burglar guts to to make those kind of throws and you know hang in there. And and you know he got rid of the ball quickly this year. That was part of the scheme they ran. And you know that you know will some of that translate? Yes, but you also I, he has fewer situations that I think he would fit cleanly into like Raiders second round. Sure. Absolutely. You know, you've already got Aiden O'Connell, you know um, you signed the veteran, what have you. So, you know, that, that kind of spot would be great. Knicks probably will be overdrafted, but in the right hands, a la Sean Payton or something like that, you know, I could see it working. He was really good in the red zone uh, by the end of the week down in mobile. Yeah. You know, he changed the way he played quarterback over the years. He's a different player. He's matured. So, yeah, those guys I think are are a, a level below what we have, and you could you could possibly win with them. But McCarthy is in that nether sphere too, nether sphere I would say in between the two. Where I'm with you, I I don't I think he's got decent tangibles. You know, I mean it would probably put him, you know, in the upper half of the league's quarterbacks, but I don't know about the upper half of the league starters. You know what I mean? I wouldn't say that as definitively. Um, but I think people are kind of enamored with what they view as this, this, 
you know, this equanimity, right? This coolness in the face of pressure and stuff, even if there is some tape that belies that, right? Even if there is some Maryland out there and um, in other games, uh, the Penn State game, you know, he didn't really show us much. You know, there was other spots where you thought they they were so heavily dependent on the run. It's hard not to have that bias against him, right? Even if there there is some of it where you say, all right, I could see him thriving in the league. I just suspect he's going to be one of those sort of more win at all cost guys. And he'll probably have a, a, a record that, that makes him look better than he is necessarily and stats that make him look worse than he is. So I just feel like he's always going to be the, the is Eli elite type of quarterback for this generation. I really Coaches do. are going to love him too. You put him in front of a whiteboard in front of a meeting. I mean, yeah, that's I, true. I joked, I joked with you with the combine. He was freaking captain America talking to the media in yeah. Indianapolis. And that's going to resonate with teams looking for a guy that that's going to represent their organization and be a leader face of the franchise. Right. We hear it all the time. And, and yes. And like, if you can't handle that part of it, you probably can't succeed at quarterback. I know that sounds ridiculous to some people like, well, what if you have all the ability in the world? You know, we're talking about kind of the compartmentalization and the responsibilities that come just like some coaches are great at coordinating, but aren't great head coaches, right? It's similar with quarterback where, you have to take the 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 brunt of the responsibility when you lose. You have to defer praise when you win. You have to face the media more often than your teammates. All these things come with the position. You have to face your teammates in practice when things aren't going well or in games, et cetera. So the mental part of it is so important. That's why McCarthy's going to sing to a lot of people. But then again, look at Jaden Daniels. I mean, you know, he's got that same kind of quality to him, too. I don't think it's as obvious until you kind of drill down on him. That's why maybe Washington's saying we want culture changers. And we don't think, you know, this is just me talking. I don't know what their actual thinking is yet. But we don't think J.J. is quite talented enough. But Jaden's got some of those same qualities. And he's got the 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 crude matter to to kind of make up for it. So, it, it really is one of the more interesting quarterback years we've had in a long time. And this is how you can kind of parse them and, and break them down and, and, you know, put them side by each and ask who the best is for your team. Giants Auto Podcast is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Joined by Eric Edholm. Eric, so let's say the quarterbacks are all gone by the time the Giants get the six here, right? And they have those two of those three receivers staring you at the face. And I think you, much like with the quarterbacks, you talk to 10 different teams, you're probably going to have seven or eight different orders of those top three wide receivers. I think all three are top 10 worthy. What I like about it is that they're all a little bit different, right? Marvin Harrison is kind of that six, four guy that moves like a six foot guy. Odunze yeah. is more of your contested catch guy who doesn't look that fast on tape, yeah, but always I separates know. just enough to make the play. And then he tested really, really well. And yeah. then you have a league neighbors who I'll just summarize it for giant fans. Do you remember Odell Beckham Jr.'s yeah. athleticism when he came out? That's the guy. That's yep. Malik neighbors. It's the same dude. Yep. And it's hard not to have like the school bias when you watch a prospect, right? You're like, he reminds me of this guy. And then he ends up about 50% of the time ends up being a quarter a player at that position, but or at that school, I mean, but that was what I was thinking when I watched him the way he's can kind of sink his hips after the catch and, you know, really get into that that yak mode immediately and, and fluidity and body control. You know, concentration drops are, are are a thing. They're not they're not huge in his game, but they're part of it too. And Odell had that same thing as well. And so yeah, I mean it's I'm not saying he's exactly the same guy, but there's so much overlap. It's hard not to think that way. And you know, obviously if you think well Odell hasn't been that great recently, but no. Prime Odell, and of course, Giants fans remember it very well, was a different beast. And I think this guy is going to be very similar to that. Um, you know, he's he's just a blast to watch. And I've gone back and forth, like, do I like him more than Marvin Harrison Jr.? But when you watch Marvin, as you put it, you know, a six four guy who moves the way you'd expect a six foot guy to move. I think that's a pretty good way to frame it. Body control. If he had a more accurate quarterback, I mean, McCord wasn't terrible last year, but he wasn't great. He wasn't elevating his game. It was a lot more evident when you saw him with CJ. And so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's special, no doubt. If his last name was Johnson or Smith or Peters or whatever, I would still love him as a prospect. This isn't anything to do with his dad, but 
you know, it's hard not to tell that football's in his DNA. It's in his blood. He looks like a natural out there. Um, I wish he was a little more dominant. I wish he was a, would take over games more often. But again, some of that was dictated by coverage and things like that. So, you know, Adunze has always been one of my favorites because he's so smooth and just such a, a – like a cool customer out there. And like, it, like you said, that late separation too, where you think he's running even with the corner and the last second, he just kind of adds that extra juice. Watch the Oregon game, watch the, Oh, I think it was the Washington state game too, where he made some spectacular plays. You thought, you know, how does he get that late separation? It, and it really does come down to subtle route running. Like he'll be running it, 85 90 percent and then he just gives that yeah. extra little kick at the end body control natural athleticism he's got it all like when i said you know he was one of the best athletes in the draft i didn't mean that he was the most explosive but like if you're playing pickup basketball you'd pick roma dunze if you're doing any other sport that required you know non-football you'd take him and i just think he's he's got that kind of um you know I, I don't know that he'll be he might be like a more flashy Keenan Allen is kind of what I've been, you know, comparing him to. Yeah. I think someone, I think it was Dan Jeremiah had a Larry Fitzgerald comp for him. And I thought that was I couldn't go that too. big, but, he, but, but Dan is better. Th- I mean, yeah, I mean, Daniel's the man. So like, I will never question his, but yes, I see that. I see exactly what he's saying though. Yeah. The, the, the size, not the overwhelming athleticism, but yes. he just knows how to, 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 to get open. I'm with you on that. Yep. All right. Other top 10 worthy players. Give me a, any other guys besides the quarterbacks and receivers you mentioned that you think are worth the bang for your buck simply based on grade and evaluation and what you're hearing around the league for the Giants at six? What other players should they be considering there? Yeah, I mean, Joe Alt is terrific. And I, and you know, I mean, you saw it the last two years at left tackle. And it was funny. I just for a laugh, I went back and watched some of his freshman tape. And this is a kid who played tight end in high school was thrown in there midway, you know, not even midway. It was like kind of early in his freshman year. They had had four injuries that position. They threw this kid in there. Yes, son of a, you know, 12-year pro for the Chiefs, but somebody who hadn't really played offensive line much and a couple little struggles here and there, but but boy, he figured it out fast. And that's just something that it, it, there was like a Joe Thomas quality to him that I was like, okay, natural, understands leverage, doesn't play over his skis, always feels in control. Like even if you blast him with power, he can kind of root down and and really do a good job of it for a big guy too, especially. So love him in the top 10. I feel like he's a safe pick there. You know, I think there are a couple offensive linemen other than him that I would consider in the top 10, but it's a little bit of a, you know, there's, there's still some of a, enough questions with some of these guys like Amarius Mims. I wouldn't just because I feel like they haven't seen enough of them. Um, Olu Fushano. I'm not quite as high on him as other people are, but I wouldn't kill anybody for taking him at the end of the top 10. Eric, um, fashion is, I, I want to talk to you. I want to follow up on fashion yeah. because he's interesting to me. You watch him in pass pro. He looks like a 320 pound ball, you know, ballerina, like his Smooth. feet are awesome. Yeah. But then in the run game, I know people talk about his strength. That's not the concern for me. The dude's on the ground all the time, run blocking. Like, he doesn't have – I've never heard of a 320-pound guy that is better balanced moving backwards than he does moving forwards. It's it's, it's very weird to see on tape for me. I can't quite figure it out. I haven't – I haven't loved him. I mean, I've – I've I again, I get why people – you know, and last year was was maybe a little bit better. I had heard some people sort of suggesting, hey, maybe he was kind of protecting himself a little bit this year and not trying not to get hurt. But the point that you made, which is that – <clears throat> the lack of of stout power in the run game, I think, is going to hurt him. Um, it feels like he has – it's not a motor issue necessarily, but he doesn't generate a lot of juice off the snap going forward. And yeah. that's – you know, and that's just like – that's going to hold me back. It's going to – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, hey, look, for pass-heavy teams, you know, that, that, that do a lot of short setting and stuff like that, you know, that he could be terrific for him. But – you know, if, if I'm on a team that is is Pittsburgh or something like that, I don't see how they could take him. You know what I mean? Like just using that as an example. But I mean, the question is how many defenders are worth taking in the top 10? And the names I've heard are like Dallas Turner, 
Terry and Arnold, Quinion Mitchell, um, you know, so a couple of corners, a couple of pass rushers, maybe Jared Verse. I don't know that I'd go that high on him. I think he's a solid player. I don't know that he's a great one. I agree. And then Brock Bowers is like the – how high do you rate that position in terms of importance? And are you – willing to say he's just a playmaker like when i asked brandon bean about taking the the dalton kincaid in round one last year i said you know how did you sort of view that especially with a tight end on board already and he said we look for playmakers and i think that's going to be the quote that whatever team drafts brock bowers is going to say we're not worried about the position we want a player who can consistently gain yards after the catch and that's what he does so is that top 10 i don't know I still haven't gotten a great feel for that. So, I mean, there's still some great players out there at, after that point, but obviously with the the quarterbacks gone and maybe a couple of those receivers, it does, you know, take a little of the bite out of that, that top end talent. Yeah. He's one of the best run after catch tight ends I've ever seen. Love him. After the catch yeah. Spectacular, really good players. It doesn't matter if one, the team wants to pull the trigger on. I'm with you. All right, folks, don't forget the giant subtle podcast is brought to you by citizens. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. They named a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by The Banker as the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle. Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. With Eric Edholm. All right, Eric, let's touch on a couple things here general with this draft class. You already mentioned it. It's a great class for some premium positions. How many offensive tackles do you think end up going in the first round? I think it could be as many as eight. I'm counting Fautanu from Washington as a tackle. Why wouldn't you put him in yeah. tackle the way he measured and tested? Uh, and then we'll talk about the wide receivers after that. But w- and any of those tackles in that first round conversation, you maybe particularly like more than than somebody else. Yeah, I wish we'd seen a little bit more from J.C. Latham, but he's going to go in the you know in the first. So he's a top twenty pick. All I already mentioned, uh, Fuaga. How would it have to be three? Fatanu, as you mentioned, I love him. He, he's my sixteenth or seventeenth overall player. I'd be stunned if he wasn't a top twenty five pick um mims i think gets in uh tyler guyton i think gets in both guys based on potential we did see guyton down at the senior bowl have some nice moments down there fashionu as well so we're up to seven and then i guess the question would be am i missing somebody is there an obvious one i'm missing jordan morgan and i like morgan yeah i think would be the probably the next two guys who's the next one you said uh uh, kingsley suamatia oh yes sorry yes um he could be, you know, I think there's a team like I could see the Chiefs taking him at the end of round one. That wouldn't shock me whatsoever. He's another player that you look at and you're expecting like, wow, he's so big. I'm going to see him throw some guys around. That's not really his game. I mean, he's he's sort of a dancing bear type almost, you know, so uh, but interesting player, former five star recruit. I mean, plenty to like about him. He's borderline for me. First round. I don't yeah, really do. know if. Yeah, but but, you know, do we get some centers? You know, what does Graham Barton make it as a tackle or a center? Uh, you know, does I don't think Zach Frazier with the injury and not being able to work out, that's a little bit of a reach, maybe. But Jackson Cooper Powers BB, Johnson, Jackson Powers Powers. Johnson. I mean, Jordan Morgan, I think could be a guard on some teams' list, but still played a lot of tackle at Arizona. So, I mean, yeah, what do you set the O line number at? Eight and a half, nine, nine and a half. I think Crazy. it's 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 nuts. It really could be almost one third of the of the first round. It's funny for me for the wide receivers, Eric. I feel like in like the general draft community, Brian Thomas Jr. has kind of taken that number four wide receiver spot. For me, I don't think it's that close. I I, I honestly probably have well, when all said and done of A.D. Mitchell as as my fourth wide receiver. Um, I can see it. Yep. Your thoughts on when that fourth wide receiver is going to go, assuming those top three mm. guys go in the top 10 or 11, when does that fourth guy go off the board? And who do you think is, is really in the mix for that fourth spot? Yeah, I suppose it, tr- it depends on a couple of teams up high who could trade down. Like for instance, the chargers just let go of Mike Williams just traded uh, Keenan Allen. Certainly they could use some help there. They have what Joshua Palmer and, uh, you know, the TCU kid and a few others, but not much. I mean, they could use some more help there. How far down are they moving from, from number five? Likewise, Cardinals, you know, they just got, they moved on from, from Rondale could use, you know, Hollywood as well. So they certainly could use another receiver. That's why everyone's assuming that if they stay at four, they're taking Marvin, but you know, what happens if they move down quite a bit to like the Minnesota picks or something. So 
you know, what if Denver strikes? Uh, I don't know if that's a good one because I think they still probably have enough there. But, you know, the Saints losing Michael Thomas, they're kind of sitting at number 14. I mean, they've they've gone, I think, defensive players the last couple of years. In the, no, I guess they did take the tackle two years ago. But How about the um, Steelers? They traded Deontay Johnson. That's another team that could use a second receiver, right? Absolutely. Colts, they need playmakers, you know, whether it's Bowers, Thomas, Mitchell, somebody like that, right? I mean, I think they're they are happy with Josh Downs. They just re-signed Pittman, but the whole idea is they want to surround uh Richardson with as many options as possible. So yeah, we kind of look in that, you know, I would say eight to sixteen range. Seahawks aren't taking one, obviously, after all the receivers they've had recently, but yeah, I mean, even Jacksonville, I know everyone has them pegged for a corner, but, you know, you lose Ridley, and is there a true kind of separator game number, you know, number one type guy there? I mean, they're, they're – I, I think it's somewhere in that 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 early to mid-teen range that we see that fourth one come off. And like you said, with, with Mitchell and Thomas, I wouldn't be shocked if they're like back-to-back -back picks or very close somewhere in round one. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens, so go to that retreat. Knew you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? And as good as this wide receiver class is at the top, Eric, round two and three, much like the first round is going to be dominated by the offensive tackles, rounds two and three are going to be dominated by wide receivers. We could see a dozen, I think, go in, in those two rounds. So many good players, different shape, sizes, and skill sets, too, that you can just yep. plug and play in and I think feel really good about it. Uh, you can comment on that and then any other positions you really like on day two in terms of depth. Yeah, everyone from Roman Wilson to Malachi Corley has some Debo-like qualities. Javon Baker's an interesting player. I didn't love him at first, but the more I kind of drilled down on him, I could see some talent there. You know, obviously Xavier Worthy, you know, blue. I don't know that he's going round one. I think he's more likely a early round two pick. You mentioned Devontae Walker somewhere on day two. He's going, oh boy, Keon Coleman, you know, didn't test great. But when you watch him, I mean, he's a bulldog. He's a fighter out there. I, I like his game to a degree. You know, I think he has his limitations. But Troy Franklin, too, fast guy, slim, kind of Jalen Hyatt sort of uh, mold a little bit. But you know, if you're a team like the Giants and you have all these these shiny objects staring you in the face high in round one, you do have to remember you can get a pretty good, but you know, maybe not that, but 85% of that in round two or three. So that's the debate that's going to have to come up in war rooms and say, you know, if we take a receiver, is there going to be another position that's anywhere near as good as the receivers that'll be there? That's kind of the debate of this draft. What other position groups do you like depth-wise on day two? I think guard is better than people think, or interior offensive linemen, I should say. I, I really do. And honestly, everyone pans this, this tight end group and this linebacker group, but the more I've watched it, the more serviceable players there are. So I don't think there are really many difference makers or stars at those spots other than, you know, the top one or two. But I think there's some solid, you know, sort of reserves and whatnot. But safety, I haven't loved but i've been able to find a couple guys who i think are pretty decent like uh um you know the kid from texas tech with the hyphenated name i'm just blanking right now yeah, but yes. uh the darian the Darian, yes something like that yeah, yes yeah, yeah. uh <laughs> and also uh cole bishop and a few others that i think i are... love cole bishop at the senior bowl man he he, yeah. he was maybe the best covered safety there he was great he flips his hips really nicely. I mean, he's not fast, fast, but he runs well. I mean, you know, he's he's a good player. You could do a lot worse. And he's what I wanted Ashton Davis uh, to be when he, you know, like the Jets took him in round three or whatever. But, um, yeah, I would say D tackle doesn't get me quite as excited as as I would I want it to be. But How about corner? really, corner's pretty good. Again, it's like. I don't know. There are some guys I'm a little bit conflicted on. I think Mitchell's going to really do well. I, I think he'll be a nice player. Arnold, I, I, I see the upside. I also see the potential for struggles early in his career. I wouldn't be shocked if he gets picked on a little bit. Um, Nate Wiggins is, he's almost like the AJ Terrell thing. It's like, I talked myself out of AJ Terrell coming out and I regretted it. Sorry, but 
body wise, he's very similar to Emmanuel Forbes last year. So that scares me a little bit. Uh, Kool Aid's really solid player. I kind of like him. I think he's, I think he's a good player. I don't know that he'll ever be a star, but I think he'll be good. I agree. Cooper, did you, you know, the really good talented player. We haven't seen him play in a while. That's going to hurt him a little, I think. And it's rake straw, same thing injuries. Um, you know, who's better. I mean, I was kind of on the DJ James sort of track for a while is like the underrated corner, but I think Renardo green and, and maybe the other ones Lasseter or two, I would say is like the, why aren't these guys getting a little, uh, you know, Kamari Lasseter from Georgia. I would say they should be kind of talked about just below those, those top guys, I think. So it's not bad. Max Melton too is another guy I really love. I think he's, he's going to be a very nice player. So pretty good. Yeah, and I think that could be a, a, a spot that the Giants can need some help there on yes. day two. Melton would be a nice pick for them. them. Yep. Yeah, and they could use slot or outside, to be honest with you. So that'll give them and a lot of flexibility. Both. Yep. All right, final, final, uh, two more before we let you go, Eric. You've been great. Fantastic. When does the first running back go, do you think? And who do you think Ooh. it is? Yeah, good question. Got to be – I kind of would be surprised if it was – uh, I wouldn't be shocked if we go 50 picks without a running back. I agree. You know, I like, could you pull the trigger on, on Jonathan Brooks saying like, yeah, he would have been a first had he, had he played the whole year and not suffered the knee. Yeah. I, I think you might be able to say that. So that would maybe tempt a team at some point, but after this free agency period with, with as many big sort of, you know, Josh Jacobs and Derek Henry and all these guys changing t- teams. And dude, even Joe Mixon and Aaron Jones, who nobody thought was going to change teams. They changed teams. Joe Mixon was traded. He was allowed <laughs> to keep his salary. You know what I mean? That was like a, you know, and they, then they extended seven. him by the way, which I was right. like, what? So they clearly like him. And, you know, I've always said the league cycles back the other way, but, but at the same time, free agency often dictates what is or is not going to happen in the draft. And I think that applies to, to running back. So, so I'll say somewhere in round two, you know, like a team like the, the Bengals or chargers or something. I could How about see the Cowboys a, Cowboys. I forgot about them. Good, good call there. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's, Jalen Wright worked out really well. I'm still a Trey Benson guy. I think he's really good. Uh, let me think if there's anybody else. Jonathan like, Brooks, you think, could still go first with the knee? Yeah, Brooks oh. has the best chance, I think, of being RB1, if I had to guess. Even with the injury, I think people still sort of respect what he's done. Wright is a potential upside guy for sure. He's got the juice. I don't know if the run instincts are quite as good as, as either Brooks or Benson, though. Marshawn Lloyd has gotten a little bit of buzz. And you know, obviously Caleb's pro day, he was catching balls and whatnot. And he's got a little, not quite DeAndre Swift, but that sort of guy, I would say that vibe. So he has I a think, lot of juice. I'm not sure about the vision and the instincts though. You know what I, I agree. Mean? That's the hardest. That, that was the question about Swift before too, is like he'd run in the back of his blockers and, you know, he'd make this explosive plays and then, you know, kind of make a, a a poor decision on stuff. And so there's always this little frustration factor watching him like, just do what you're told. <laughs> Good comp. But, no, I think you're right. I think it's a great comp. Yeah, there, there's some overlap there, but also a player got $8 million at a supposedly depressed position. So there's there's a need for that. Absolutely. All right, final question. Can you mention this, I think, in the answer to the first question I asked you? When does the draft fall off a cliff? You know, with NIL deals, yeah. the COVID year, there are six and even you know, I think there are a couple seven year players that are going to be in college football <laughs> last, you know, next year with the double red shirt. And then you get the extra year from the COVID year. When does that drop off happen? Is it end of the fourth round? Is it middle of the fifth round? When do we see this talent simply take a huge plunge where you're then basically looking at your priority free agent list and you have to draft them in like round six? Right subboard stuff that's when you see teams trade out and move into the next year if they can and yeah i don't know exactly where it is and it's gonna be different for different positions like you know safety to me there may be like nine worth taking a a pick on i mean i know that seems harsh but like i just don't think the depth is there running back boy i i would take the route of after the top four or five guys i don't know that i would there aren't too many backs I'd spend a pick on. That's just my personal philosophy. But, you know, I st- I do think the drop-off is is evident there. It's also evident in offensive tackle, too. I don't care what anyone says. Like, after a certain point, I'm not interested. And maybe that happens at that, that position. 
before round four, like where, Mm -hmm. you know, and then certain positions may last a little longer. You know, we're not going to see many backs or or linebackers or or safeties drafted. So that'll, that'll kick it back a little, but yeah, I mean, I receivers deep quarterback is deep, you know, there's the corner could be okay. Offensive line. Good. After that though, I think there's a, there, there are certain positions which is going to be, so maybe fifth round is where it starts getting a little lean at certain spots. We're now within a month of the draft, so I feel comfortable asking this question to people at the end of all of our podcasts. Who do the Giants pick at six, Eric? I think they're taking Malik Neighbors. I just, and it has nothing to do with Odell. I really, I mean, like, I just think, I don't think Joe cares. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think he just wants the best player. And, and yes, I think the quarterback temptation will be there. I think you could make the case for an O-lineman or a different receiver, depending on who's available. But, man, I just... There's, I don't know. I keep feeling like, boy, that's a good fit. You know, you, you would have high, you resign Hodgins, you have him, you know, you're going to have to throw the ball and see what Dale can do. And I know Drew's there and I, it's, it's a weird situation, but the best way to evaluate a quarterback is to give him a receiver. And if they're going to have to make a call on him and this is the drop down season, like we got to know, give him something to work with. And, and I think it'll, it'll help make that evaluation a lot easier. And the idea of trading up for a quarterback was you kind of just referenced that a little bit. The the temptation will be there. It does give the Giants an advantage if they do decide to do it. They're picking sixth, right? So Beautiful a team spot. that still wants to get a premium player, it'll help them. For other teams, maybe that have more a priority of stockpiling picks, maybe that hurts the Giants, right? Because you're not going to get as high of a volume of picks because you're going to get sixth overall in, in that return package. So which one of those teams... <laughs> Cardinals, Chargers, and Patriots, you think sticking at six and staying that high in the draft would be the most valuable to them rather than maybe stockpiling a a couple extra day two picks rather than staying in that top 10? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a good way to frame it too because I think New England, I could see them moving down the farthest of that group. Arizona maybe too. Again, you know, because they're not, yes, they would love a receiver. I think they'll absolutely draft one if not two. But, you know, we know they're not taking a quarterback right now. Maybe a year from now that, that changes. But, you know, they, they, would, they would probably willing to move down a, a healthy amount. Like Minnesota, obviously. They're the kind of the team with the, with the two first now that everybody, you know, 11 and, what, 23, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to – I don't think the Chargers are interested in moving out of – the top 20, but I wouldn't be shocked if they moved into the teens. So, you know, I guess I'm trying to think who would be the the natural spot. Yeah, because to me, I think the Chargers want a right tackle, right? So I think getting into that teens area for them would be like ideal. Because that's when you get they would have Latham's. their choice. Almost. That would have their choice of three or four different guys. So I think that kind of makes sense for the Chargers. I'm I worry about the Cardinals because I do think that they're gonna want to get one of those kind of elite receivers. So maybe that's the team you might be right and if new england i'm kind of with you if they pass on a quarterback that tells me all right long-term rebuild vision they'd probably want to stockpile you know what i mean they could be a double dip team too though so that could put them in play for new york and then somebody else again who's to say that that i understand you trade up for quarterbacks usually but Who's to say that, like, what if there's a freaky scenario where Marvin Harrison Jr. is there at the sixth pick, like like New England and the Giants swap, and they're not interested in drafting a receiver with no one throwing them, you know what I mean? Like, Would then the Patriots all sudden, trade with the Jets, Eric? Wouldn't that be fun if oh the Jets goodness. moved up to six to try to get – that's one thing I could see. Like, that, that's the win-now team. I could see the Jets trying to make that little jump to grab one of those top three wideouts. You're starting to see more divisional, interdivisional trades. The old school, like in Ron Wolf's day, they never would have done it, right? <laughs> but in Elliot Wolf's day, they would. So I think that makes sense. I, I you saw the Lions and Vikings make a trade last, you know, last year. Um, you know, there there are other examples of it. I think the Jets and Patriots have gone a long time without making a deal. But yeah, I'm I'm all for it. I, I love when uh, the Hatfields play with the McCoys. Belichick's not there anymore, so maybe it can be a little glasnos between the uh, <laughs> <laughs> between the Jets and the it. Patriots. I love it. I love Eric, it. Eric, all right, before we say goodbye, just tell everybody uh, what you're up to, <clears throat> what what they should check out, your Twitter account, yeah. all that other good stuff. 
just posted a top hundred list, I think last week or the week before. I got to remember now. Yeah, exactly. Everything blends together. But I've got a uh, it was two weeks ago, I guess, from the time you're going to air this. And I've got a mock draft coming out this week. So be sure to check that out. I'll be nice and kind and warm and, and friendly to, to the Giants there. And uh, yeah, then we kind of get into April and it's uh, it's a full sprint to the finish. Eric, always a pleasure to talk to you. Always fun seeing you at all these events in the offseason. Enjoy yeah. the sprint. And we'll be following all your work at NFL.com. Thanks so much. See you in Detroit. Take it easy. Eric at home, NFL.com. Check out all his work. Thanks for joining us on the Giants Huddle Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. We will see you next time, everybody. Are you self-conscious about your smile due to stains? Have you ever wished that you had a whiter and brighter smile? Smile Actives is a safe and affordable alternative to expensive whitening procedures. You simply add Smile Actives gel to your toothpaste every time you brush your teeth, making it the easiest teeth whitening solution out there. In a clinical trial, Smile Actives users reported up to five shades whiter on average, all within seven days. No change to your routine, no extra time. Right now, they are running a buy one, get one offer. Hurry to smileactives.com slash iHeart today to receive this special offer with free shipping and handling. All-inclusive vacations make life easy with endless eats, bottomless drinks, and never-ending fun. So booking an all-inclusive vacation should be easy too, right? That's where Apple Vacations comes in. Book your all-inclusive getaway with Apple Vacations and receive exclusive perks at select resorts. You'll find the best deals to Hyatt, Zalara, Riviera Maya in Mexico and enjoy a selection of exclusive nonstop vacation flights. Turn on easy mode at applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started. Visit applevacations.com or call your local travel advisor to get started.